yeah, for, for this session, the, the person who was going to be leading it, uh, something happened that was quite challenging, uh, extremely so. So they are, aren't able to join us for the session. Um, we'll just let more people come in. So what we're going to do as a, a suggested plan, and I'd love to hear all your thoughts, is for us to still address that topic if we wish. It's an ambitious topic, but I'm sure we can all connect somehow. Um, but I would like to start first by going around the the room um, and just having everyone introduce themselves, because if we find something that surfaces like through getting to know each other, that's a little bit more tailored to what we want to talk about. We can do that as well. So um, as I just mentioned, for people coming in, uh, something has happened to our session speaker and they're OK, but it's it's a very difficult a challenging time for them right now. Um, so I thought we could just do an introduction. We could try and stick to topic or uh, try to, to move in a space where we all feel is valuable for our time. So um, yeah, you guys all pretty much know me. I'm not even gonna say who I am. I've sent you enough links to my website. So I'm gonna not say anything apart from my name, Becky Inkster. And thank you all for being here. Um, I'll just go down my list. Julia, hello. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, hi, Becky. Um, this has been a, a slight change uh, since we last met. Um, I have become a, a, an associate professor in um, healthcare AI. <laughs> Congratulations. So, thank you. Now, instead of natural language processing, I, I have reached the healthcare AI finally. Um, so, yeah, and... Um, so it gives me a bit um, more relevance to to the topic. Um, yeah, and uh, I have been recently working quite a lot on the problems of uh, the morality detection in lyrics and the mood detection in lyrics using NLP methods um, and um, essentially connecting. So what I started to work on recently is essentially connecting together uh, the uh, the sentiment uh, that uh, the users have towards music with lyrics and um, with um, musical sequences as well, the sequences of notes. And essentially my, my main interest in the topic is to um, explore the interconnection between music, lyrics, and um, mental health of, of, of the listeners, how they will be um, connecting with different music, which kind of um, influences it might have. Uh, and overall, I do work a lot with natural language processing, with mental health records, mainly with uh, social media and mental health. Um, and in general, I'm um, a specialist in uh, large language models, and I have been mainly working in uh, large language modeling and multimodal learning throughout my life. I hope that's it. That That is good. That was very <laughs> thank thorough. You. Thank you. Matt. And I think moving forward, we'll be a little bit briefer with our introduction. Yeah, very, very, very sorry. I just tried <laughs> to not, explain my worry. relevance to that. <laughs> I know you well enough that we can joke around. But um, OK, so let's uh, maybe keep the intros just uh, quite brief. And just to remind people who are coming into the session um, that we have had uh, our speaker ran into a challenge. It was very difficult. So uh, we have the title of Music and Mental Health, an entire system conversation. Um, so we can either stick to that topic or we can decide to discuss other things as well. But what's important is that we're all here in the room. So if we could go to, uh, for a very brief introduction, uh, Anna, if you want to as well, there's no pressure to uh, to introduce yourself. So I'll just call your name out like school. Um, okay, uh, I'll come back to you, Anna. Claudia, if you'd like to introduce yourself, by all means, unmute and, and say hello. Hello, everyone. I've just put a little thing in the chat there. Um, I met back Becky as through my um, PhD, my uh, thesis, on the neuroscience and phenomenology, lived experience. Um, of the crea artistic uh, creative process with an emphasis on creative writing, because that's my discipline, um, but found quite a lot of commonality between how 
creatives arrive, generate their ideas and em embark in the, the, um, the developing of the artwork. Um, so that's really the intersection with everything. And then why Becky thought that I should be here today. Absolutely. And you mentioned the brain, which is always my favorite word. So yes. that got me excited. And the default mode network, maybe we can tap into that um, as well later on with your... My, fa my, my favorite thing. That's exactly. my favorite thing. So we'll come back to that, Claudia. Uh, so again, I'd say just if anyone wants to introduce themselves rather than me being a teacher in the classroom, um, just please feel free to jump in and say hello. Uh, I've noticed people are also doing in the, that in the chat. So that's great as well, because we can save some time. I apologize for helicopters. I live right behind the Abbey and it's not it's always noisy. Um, so yes. Um, so what we could do here is uh, we could either have stick close to the title, but we have a very diverse group of people with us in this space. Um, I was thinking perhaps one way is just to come from the music perspective and asking each of you or anyone to comment on how do we how do we actually implement creative thinking and what are the barriers when we're trying to combine healing or interventions with music? Are there barriers to the NHS? Are there barriers uh, when we think about working with the music industry, uh, which might have more corporate or commercial angles that don't necessarily have vulnerable vulnerable people at the heart of what they do? So just maybe talking about the some of the barriers or, or how creativity is um, trying to bridge different spaces, um, both for better or worse. So I'll I'll just stop to, to see if anyone wants to jump in or they have a personal experience of how they use it. I think I see a hand, Craig, so you go for it. If yeah. Is that a hand? Yeah, cool. And then yeah. Marcus. So, so good day, everyone. Um, it immediately occurs to me that there there is, a, at least in, in the circles, I'm in a lack of literacy and about around the evidence of the beneficial or maybe even the negative impact of music on mental health. And I think as a result of that, it then does not really even come into the consideration of providers or consumers as a, a detriment or a vehicle or, or a therapeutic vehicle. Um, but and and then, but if it became a part of the toolkit, I guess we call it right. Like right now, we have pills, we have talk. You know, telehealth is beginning to emerge. Mobile apps. Clearly, or I should say, certainly, there are apps out there that have a basis for music. Like biurnal beats are what come most readily to mind. But it being a standard of care, where when I go to talk to my doctor, it's kind of like in there. We've not arrived at that, but this certainly sets up, this discussion sets up that there's an opportunity for that. And then when I think about epidemiology, um, I'm sure this research is out there. I just have, I'm, there's just not broad literacy. Surely music is an indicator of, the mood and the mindset of populations, whether that's generational, particular social, cultural, national, it's kind of like hidden in plain sight around us all the time, but not being utilized for the purposes of giving us helpful insights about health and wellness or being utilized as therapy. So I'll, I'll leave that right there so I don't go on too long. Thank you, Craig. I like it. You're stirring... Some some minds, I'm sure. So does anyone want to jump on that thread from Craig? I've got a couple of points after. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, it was interesting, interesting, um, interesting thought because that also ties in literacy as well as expectation of music industry as well, and expectation that you're gonna write a song, you're gonna make it, etc. You're gonna get signed, all that kind of stuff as well. And that disappointment in terms of the whole model of the industry is as in that sense is is pretty much dead unless you're kind of really fortunate or in the right place at the right time etc so i think that expectation also feeds into um the disappointment in not making it by a certain time rather than actually as you said looking at creating creating art creating music or lyrics or what it would be as a means to end for for um 
for mental mental well being and, and and basically, um, so so the shift is moved on from making lots of cash and driving a Ferrari to actually getting some depth into your art as well. And then after that point, you may then get your Ferrari after that because you've become so great at being a musician, et cetera, that you will suddenly become, you know, you can, be, you, can, you can go and do these things. But I think that mentally, the thing with the, the mental health aspect, I suppose, is the, is, the, is, the, is the expectation and the disappointment that it didn't deliver, it didn't, didn't say what it says on the tin because the model has changed drastically in terms of how music is, is created, delivered, and and uh, and uh, enjoyed as well. You know, so that's also the consideration. Thanks, Mark. And we've got some stuff happening in the chat. So, if anyone wants to speak to those thoughts um, in the chat, please go ahead. I was just going to add, add something in, um, just more around what Mark was just saying, just following on from that as well. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sean. I'm for a company called Anagram, we're a sort of um, sort of immersive interactive storytelling company. But I'm I'm just here for the day, just because everything that's happening today has just been fascinating. Um, but yeah, just also to, um, a friend of mine wrote a book, um, came out a couple of years ago now, which was around, um, it was called Bodies, and it was about sort of the, basically the collapse of mental health within the music industry. So he's a music journalist, and he wrote about um, how, as a music journalist, um, he'd you know, gave a massive cocaine addict, you know, nearly died, all of those kinds of things as well. But as he's telling his story, he also interviews lots of different musicians along the way. So, yeah, he, he was hanging out with Metallica at one point, all of these kind of things. He was you know, doing all sorts of stuff. But um, in the book as well, one of the he interviews um, someone from a band called Goat Girl. They're a sort of, you know, young indie band, been around for a couple of years, um, and they have all decided that they are not going to give up their day jobs. They have a record deal. They have, you know, they get good play on six music and all of that kind of thing. But it's just like, you know what? Our mental health is not worth going on tour for four, five months, getting by on five quid a day, if you're lucky, um, you're hoping you sell enough t-shirts to just get through that initial bit. And it's just, you know, they're just like, literally that we would rather all work in cafes, offices, and get enough leave together so that, you know, festival season arrives, we can spend weekends going to festivals, do a couple of weeks on tour, and that's it. Go back to our day jobs because it's just not worth killing ourselves to have a career in the music industry and that's what it and they, and they were just kind of like and they've and you know i've got friends friends of friends who have who have taken their own lives who have you know, you know disappeared and aren't coming back and that's it's and you know the idea of making it now is so I mean, again you've got friends who are who are sort of you know would be considered successful in that you know they've got a mortgage and you know they've been making music professionally for you know 20 years and and are still able to, and are able to live off it, but they're not they're not household names. They're not anything like that. But it's just that kind of the gap between where it used to be and the, at the top now is so vast that you know it, even going from sort of you know sort of playing toilet circuit toilet you know, toilet venues to playing Wembley, it's you know yeah you, you, I say you almost have to break yourself if you want to want to do that. And that's just kind of that the expectation is just there now that you have to break your mental health if you want to become successful. I'm just going to jump off that, Sean, and then I see Mark's hand. Um, and even when you make it to that top level, uh, the pressure to sing songs that you really aren't in the right mind space, like, you, you know, you wrote it when you were feeling a certain way, and now they're asking you to push the song and, and promote it. That's really triggering and could be traumatic to revisit that when they're forcing you to do that. So even at the top, it can be uh, mental health as well. So um, and. Uh, Mark, and is there anyone else, like, feel free, I, I don't want domination of conversation, I want, like, chat and uh, chat and also, you know, people speaking up. So, Mark, over to you, but please, yeah, just jump yeah, in I'll if you want to say keep, something. Yeah, keep it short as well. Interesting we say about that book as well, and also relates into Craig's idea of literacy, etc. What we really need now is, is business activity came in and also how the business works and you know I've, I've got my own record label I've done this for, for years I've done all sorts of licensing deals and remixes and major labels and all this kind of stuff as well and in the end it's not about it's not about it, the people that tend to make it seem to be a personalities or a certain phenotype basically that, in that sense I've known many people in the metal world who did a lot of stuff in rock stuff with people playing from bands called you know like Testament and and um, Skyclad, Andy Sneap was also is a, is a metal producer, all sorts of Cradle of Filth, et cetera. And I've been doing loads of work and they've been ripped off immensely because they've messed up the business and stuff. And they've had no no training about this. It's been the typical kind of 
music manager, sign this, sign this, etc. And then then you're in. But then literacy also comes into this as well. Also that that um acumen, business acumen as well. But so people trying to do it now have got more business savvy. But also that's the thing, the divide as you're saying now is massive because my other my other half Amanda, she's doing making a grassroots promotion touring circuit limit to promote um, mid mid uh, mid number coming acts to actually get to get play to get the gigs etc and and we get a lot of resistance because in promotion promoters don't want you to play because they don't have they they want to make instant money from the bar etc 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 all this kind of thing, thing as well and so the average musician can't navigate through this they can't they haven't got the they haven't got the background or the skill set to be able to navigate through. or it's sometimes even when they're to 18 20 they haven't got the life skills to go through this as well so that whole sense of not keeping your day job while doing this i mean we it's like it's like, it's like we've been recently gigged over in manchester lower level london all sorts of places we've got some gigs probably come up with in, in the states as well at some point the, later on this year and so Again, it's this expectation. You've got to plug yourself into a bigger act. So the, the divide is getting more and more. It's getting wider. The expectation is getting bigger. Because obviously you see a superstar. You want to become that superstar. You want to be the next United Twain or your next, you know, next whatever, you know, or next next kind of, the, um, you know, the next big thing. And yeah. this is this is the way the mental health in terms of expectations. It goes into the whole kind of thing of looking at, um, um, saying you know, it's the it's the image versus the content, and so what we're, where we are now, especially with TikTok, with especially with social media, the image is there. Nobody wants to sit down and play guitar anymore, or kind of learn how to sing. They want to you know, instant karma. You know that that's where we are at the moment, and it's and causing also, massive okay. knock-on effects. I'll just stop you there because I saw Craig's hand go up. So if you wanted to jump off that, Craig, I think you. Yeah. So so a dot connected mark as you were talking. So earlier today. Vanessa, I was looking at your organization, Founder Well, right, which is really cool. And Mark, as you were talking, I wonder, does anyone know of any programs or interventions that we might call Musician Well, <laughs> where, where we are actually engaging and interacting with aspiring musicians, artists, and helping them to appreciate and understand the mental health toll of the career that they're entering into, as well as to appreciate the research around the mental health vulnerabilities that come with being a sensitive, creative soul. Anyone? I don't think there's been anything out there. Mostly it's about the only things that are out there are ways to get ways to you know sing sing loud so uh, again my other half teaches she teaches uh she teaches singing as well and she teaches so the so the so the um so the um standard today is actually to belt out songs it's like to be you know just to really kind of like belt it out and there's no nuance etc so everybody sounds exactly the same so they're all trying to compete each other and even in the class they're all kind of saying well i'm not quite as good as her and then i'm like this and there's a packing order and it's all very sad and even with you're thinking, well, if you've got my apps, is that if you put it as a an app, you don't want you want to have it to be an individual, an individual personal goal setting. And it's like well, I, that app I use a lot. I revitalized my guitar playing. It's called Guitar Pro Eight, and it's just basically you can play along with this stuff. You can tablet you can play along. It's all the sound is fantastic. I I I get I get a real buzz off playing it. So you learn to play a track, and it give and it basically can do it. There's no scoring. It's just basically if you can play it as it sounds, and it sounds great. But what I've seen is this gamifying almost of music in terms of um, create have an app where you say I'm gonna I'm not gonna play I've just seen adverts on YouTube saying play piano an hour you can play a thousand songs you know and this expectation that after after an hour I'm gonna play that rack money off and so but again it's this massive expectation you're gonna play massively well or not well at all so all in the music business it's all about the goal the journey is not mentioned it's just like either you make it or you're a loser you know this is what so even i've found i've worked with remixes with i've worked also i've tracks um and work done with emi sony um i've had um christmas record etc the same thing you had a producer a track which sounds really good and then even that point it's politics to say well that track will actually go out or not so you might have done five months of work and get nothing out of it as well so i have a lot of songwriting sessions in nashville we do that as well all sorts of different things 
And I mean, I'm doing some rap stuff at the minute and some rap guitar stuff at the minute and lots of production. Um, Mark, I'm just going to stop, just gonna stop you there because I want to bring it back to yeah, mental, yeah, focus on mental thing, health. Yeah. So yeah, the mental but... health aspect of this is that all these things were expected, but people aren't given the skills. So, so for me, I've been doing this for 40 years. So far, I've worked solidly at this. People expect to get that 40 years in 10 minutes. And that's the expectation that you've got but, to give a, a massive. So that's the mental health aspect in terms of that expectation. You can't live up to the, you can't live up to it. I ever. like the comment that, that Craig posted, and there's a lot of other stuff I haven't managed to get through, but the, the career mental health education possibility um, and the idea of, you know, attaching mental health to artists, aspiring artists or, uh, you know, middle artists and, and top, uh, whether it be through uh, record label um, mental health support that's built in. I think that's a very challenging space to try and get mental health support for uh, young artists but again that that's a gap of you know what about the aspiring people in their bedrooms on a Friday night and how do we yeah. get the mental health support there so I, I think a lot of people are doing it in little pockets uh, yep. you know great uh, things like key changes they work with uh, service users and you know music is their intervention um, but again it's these little pockets we need these big spaces that are, are controlling the music um to to start you know playing just like how we saw big tech uh needing that so uh but yeah let's open the conversation even more so paul uh you patiently had your hand up so what are your thoughts um well it's interesting conversation i started off putting a post in the chat about um music being important in all of the mental health and, and suicide prevention work that, that i do and has been for many many years and then obviously i've listened to people talking about the music business um, it sounds very similar to people talking about the sports business, you know, through the 70s, 80s and 90s. And it, it has changed a lot. Um, I've worked with a lot of uh, sports youth academies that are, are very good now at looking after the mental health of the, the ones who don't make it, the ones who have career threatening injuries, the, you know, the ones that have to be let go, et cetera, et cetera. And on our recent tour, which was uh, in partnership with the Rugby League Cares Foundation, they run programmes funded by Movember, uh, which is very much about mindset and, and expectations and, and what you can do and what you can't do and coping with disappointment and, and knockbacks, et cetera, et cetera. And they started off running those for sports organisations, but now they run them for all sorts of organisations. They run them for the NHS. They run them for anybody who wants to do their programmes, offload and ahead of the game and so on. It sounds like some of the people in the music industry or trying to get in the music industry with, uh, or, or who have been unsuccessful in the music industry would benefit from those programs. So I think, you know, think transferability as well, rather than uh, within your own sector um, and, you know, as well as development within the sector. Um, but, but also I won't, I won't go on now, but I've also put in some stuff about, you know, some other sort of suicide prevention anthems that we've developed over our work and, that we took on tour with us and and uh, the radio show as well, the Jordan Legacies radio show, Jordan Space, where people come on and talk about their lived experiences and they talk about their music and songs that resonate with them. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this broader field, shall we say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so anyone, feel free to jump in, but I, I agree. We need to measure this stuff to show how good it is and uh, how it works because it, uh, some of you might know the paper um, that looked at the rapper logic and he gave three live performances and the Austrian professor and his team found that uh, when he gave those performances afterwards the suicide rate uh, was substantially reduced and 245 I think 245 lives uh, were saved so uh, the messaging from his song which is about suicide prevention it was captured with an evidence base so it's really powerful um, but but um, yeah, please. Um, just one, sorry, just one other yeah. thing. I'll give you just a, a one big statistic to give you. At the end of our recent tour, we went to Sean's place in Liverpool. And if you're not aware of Sean's place, you should be. It's a world class service in Bootle, set up by Debbie Rogers after she lost her brother Sean to suicide, and the system had let him down. And she started off in a, in a community hall in a room with six chairs. <laughs> And last year they had 3,000 blokes came through uh, Sean's place. And um, when Debbie first set it up, she just asked these blokes what support they needed. And one of them said he'd like to have guitar lessons. He always wanted to learn how to play the guitar. So he learned how to play the guitar. Now that guy was 
playing guitar at our concert in Liverpool. First time they'd ever played outside of Sean's place at Liverpool Arts Bar and was in Seventh Heaven. And they had eight blokes standing on the stage saying, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for Sean's place. So it might not be documented in an academic sense and, and evaluated formally, but you know, they're starting off trying to help one person and helping 3,000 people. And they've also got a choir called the Choir of Hope with 40 blokes who've all lived through suicide attempts. And they finished uh, at the Sean's Place event we had with a rousing performance of Elton John's I'm Still Standing, all punching the air at the end. <laughs> That's great. That's great, Paul. Um, and yeah, yeah. So I appreciate that um, because it's happening. And and I agree. You just sometimes don't have to measure it. You just know it's working. Um, but the data scientist in me that wants to show the policymakers just wants to like bridge to show good kind of thing. Uh, but we have Sean. Um, you had your hand up, so over to you. Are oh, you good? You're good. Okay, Mark. And, and let me just check. Anyone else? Yeah, just scroll back and forth. But yeah, go for it, Mark. Yeah, I thought I thought it was Paul said it's this movement to it, it bring back the importance of music in because basically it's been almost trivialized, I think, in a lot of senses where you know people don't think they can do it, but actually, or they, they feel they never had the opportunity to do it. But if you go to create a community, community places where people can go and make music or actually or share or you know, share stories, etc., or share problems, that's a real big so it can be a multi level type thing. I think it has to be it has to be a grassroots type scenario because I don't I don't think anybody's going to invest in this because obviously they can't see the immediate money making aspects of it. So it's just that thing of having an important place like Sean's place that's really important as well, and it's getting that it's 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 having a forum where people can express themselves and yeah. and without criticism. Is that that's the other thing as well? I think a lot of people don't come forward. I saw another statistic about especially in men not coming forward and not to be the men don't tend to talk about stuff anyway so uh about men not coming forward and, and sharing problems and seeing it as some kind of failure etc so having, a, having an environment where people can play i think music is integral in that whichever whichever genre you're going to use whatever age group whatever demographic yep. it's important to keep, keep bring that value back yep. for music but that's i think that's yeah, what we're also, missing at the just, moment yeah just one other thing as well when i went to sean's place they had three it's had a performance space there in, in a practice room uh, in that space. It's got National Lottery funding now. And they've got three bands. They've got Sean's Band, they've got the Choir of Hope, and they've got Solace of Sound, which is 15 and 16-year-olds, bereaved by a suicide. They're absolutely amazing band. And we've, we've made them our headline act at the Liverpool Arts Bar, but the, um, uh, which made their mum and dad very happy. <laughs> but the, um, we wanted a venue and we asked around what kind of venues people would like to play in. And somebody said it'd be great to play in the Philharmonic Hall. So we thought, well, okay, we'll try them. Probably out of our budget, but we'll try them. And they said, right, yeah, we can you can have our space. It's 550 quid and here's the rate card for the extras, right? So it was outside of our budget. Um, so I went across the road to, because we wanted to be on Hope Street. We wanted to have a hope gathering on Hope Street. That was really important to us. So I went across the road to the Liverpool Arts Bar. I explained what we were doing in aid of suicide prevention. And uh, and they said, yeah, great, you can come here for free. <laughs> so we went to Liverpool Arts Bar. And uh, so we had Sean's band on and we had Solitary Sound finishing off as a headline act and they were absolutely incredible. So, yeah, you've got to have the venues, obviously, for it, but you've got to go where the energy is. You've got to go to the right people. You've got to ignore the people who think entirely commercially. Even a charity, the Philharmonic Hall is a charity, but it thinks commercially. Whereas the arts bar thinks like a community hub. I love that. I love that. Go with the energy. Definitely resonates. Does anyone had has anyone had an experience with that where that was the right decision to go with it, as opposed to talking about business models and putting that first? Or other thoughts? Yeah, Sean, go for it. I'm on mute. I'm not on mute anymore. Um, yeah, I think this is just. I think what the stuff that you were just talking about there about the sort of community, the grassroots, and the commercial models and things like that's really sort of struck home. And it also, also would tie to what Vanessa's been doing as well with founders as well. I think you know, there is this kind of um, your definitions of success and what that means, um, and that can mean it can be in sport, it can be in music, it can be in different cultural things. And Mark was talking quite a lot about people that really wanting to, you know, they want to be there, they want to be the headliner at Glastonbury. And so on but actually you know for yeah you know, just for some people just playing you know 
bottom of the bill on the Thursday night before the festival's open on a stage in front of 20 people. They've made it. And it's like, we've, and we've, and it's how to sort of generate, and there's, there's, there is something in the mental health around actually, what does it mean to, to have succeeded? What are your, what are you doing? And what are your goals? I mean, you know, again, outside of, outside of the work that I'm doing, I'm you know, setting up this business, whatever. I'm also part of a small community radio station. Um, we broadcast every weekend. People do pre-records from home. They, be, they, they go live. And our goal is to let people have make music and have a, and open it up to the marginalised voices. Whoever anybody can have a show, kind of thing. That's the idea that we're working towards. And we're never going to make any money. That's not the idea. You know, everybody involved is a volunteer. You know, we're, we're paying sort of PRS licensing out of our own pocket and all of that kind of thing. But it's more important to do that than try and make something big and massive that we can't control. And so I think there is something in that, what in, in around how you manage aspirations. And again, yeah, so Vanessa's got a hand because I just want to lean into something from Vanessa as well, that kind of, you know, that gap between, I want to have a business which can support a dozen employees and everyone's happy and everyone can pay their mortgage. Um, or, and, the, and, the, and getting to that point seems quite difficult because then you have to, then you have to, have to get investment and you have to have, millions of pounds in and then yeah and the, and the gap between sort of doing something small and sustainable and do and it and how that that and having that sort of small sustainable sort of community-led yeah. community-focused ecosystem just feels like it's really missing at the moment yeah that's great vanessa you had your hand up um hey everyone thanks so much uh for today it's been amazing and um yeah i can share my experience so i work with founders with high growth founders uh predict uh, particularly in tech, um, also some fast moving consumer brands as well, um, both bootstrapped and VC backed. Um, definitely what Sean was um, uh, just leading, leading into queuing uh, over to me. Uh, yeah, this idea of success and, um, and always this tension of um, and really what is enough, right? Because we often feel um, never enough or not enough and, and you know, in this, this tension. And what's interesting is um, we use music actually quite a bit within our practice and within our protocols. And what it does is, um, so we, we use um, a specific safe and sound protocol with Dr. Stephen Forges, um, which uh, is essentially a practical application of the polyvagal theory. So it's modified music that works with the middle ear in order to essentially, you know, calm down that threat detection. And when you're under, you know, whether you have, because um, we work within uh, this intersection of trauma and entrepreneurship um, as well. And so whether it's developmental, environmental, um, or uh, um, just the the chronic stress that um, we tend to be under, right? There's this, um, and if we talked about business, right? Looking at safety only in the context or risk in the context of safety and what's actually the physiological um, uh, uh, changes or like the pathways that we're dealing with versus this cognitive psychological, yes, I can think that I'm safe, but how do I actually feel, especially within my own business and how does that affect the people around me. So using um, Dr. Porges's work and this music has been really interesting because I, and this is, I started FounderWell coming out of um, 10 years working with B2B SaaS founders, being a founder myself, um, starting scaling, launching companies. And it really was out of the strategic work of what's getting in the way, right? We all know what we need to do, but what's really, really getting in the way. And as soon as we started, focusing more on the uh, therapeutic side. So we have an integrative approach of therapeutic, strategic, and systemic. Um, I've seen the biggest shift with founders that I have worked for for years um, uh, strategically. And then as soon as we move into some of the work, especially with this passive um, delivery of the polyvagal theory, all of a sudden these blocks that they've been stuck with just uh, just almost like melt away. And now they're closing bigger deals. They're seeing more um, better uh, team relationships. They're um, taking bigger risks, so to speak. Like it's just all, and we're not even talking about business in these conversations. We're really just focusing on the internal work. I don't have, um, anecdotally, it's been pretty amazing to see the changes over the last 
year and a half or so, but that's what I'm focused on and want to do is start to track it um, quantitatively as well. It's like, can we start to measure when we really stop focusing on the business and then again, start focusing on wellness, like how that actually improves business at, um, outcomes. So um, that's probably all over the place, but yeah, it's a really fascinating topic and uh, I feel like it's almost magic <laughs> sometimes of how it works. So um, yeah, and, and a lot of the work we do too is um, um, expert by experience. So I actually never heard that term before, I think of it as like peer support or peer coaching and especially within the trauma recovery models that we use but I really loved uh, the previous conversation on shared experiences and because that creates a lot of sense of safety and vulnerability in different conversations in our spaces um, which I would say are brave spaces uh, compared to a lot of the other ecosystems that I've been a part of um, you know through accelerators or coaching programs or you know angels and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. If I can connect a few dots quickly, Vanessa, I love that. So this is clearly one of the uh, departments of the National Wellness Service <laughs> that we're conceiving, right? And, yes, definitely. I, have believe, yeah. and I, have to, I have to believe that um, this, so, you know, I'm an MBA and an MPH, right? I can't help but not be thinking about commercial potentials all the time. But man, somebody wants to pay for this. <laughs> somebody wants to pay for the health of those that drive economic activity. And in the current context, we we strongly believe that entrepreneurs are that, right? So I'll leave that right there because we don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But as we think about how do we rationalize this for those that have resources who would want to put the resources in this space. That's one. And then the other one, peer support is a scale mechanism, Vanessa, which leaves us not just with the prof the licensed professionals, but gives us the opportunity to scale our wellness in our communities. And I'll stop right there. Because Becky, you know, I can get going on this. I, I don't wanna... mind. I don't mind at all. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll cut you off because I know you, Craig, but you were fine. No trouble. But who, who's next? <laughs> can, can I also just mention, on picking up on that point, I did some projects. I did a project with Newcastle, uh, Central Square building, which is an old Royal Mail sorting office next to the station. And that was developed by Prabhula Estate, so um, uh, very creative. And People wanted that to be an arts venue. Well, it couldn't be an arts venue. Economically, it couldn't be an arts venue. It had to pay its way commercially. So what they did there was the top three floors were entirely commercial space, and they were rented out by Lloyds Bank with a call centre on the top floor, which is the grimmest end of the commercial spectrum you can get to, really. But the ground floor was taken over by Northern Arts. So when you walked in the ground floor, it was like an arts venue. Um, but if you, you know, went up the lift, you went to Grimsville Lloyds Bank, um, and then that was developed at Parabola's King's Place building, which is as the King's Place Foundation, now next to King's Cross Station. That was also a Royal Mail sorting office. That's commercial space up above, including the Guardian and Observer headquarters now. Uh, but the foundation is downstairs in the ground floor and the, the lower ground. It has a state-of-the-art concert hall and fantastic facilities. So you have to marry up the commercial with... Uh, you know, with the creative and the arts and everything else to, to survive. And I'm looking at a multi-purpose building in York at the moment, which will bring a whole bunch of charities and social enterprises together. But if they just think like a charity, they're in the wrong place. They can go and stay in their own little building and have jumble sales. They've got to have a social enterprise mindset to survive in this environment. Got quiet. What's going on? <laughs> Who's next? <laughs> Jump in, yep. Yeah. I was trying to find my mute, my unmute button. So uh, um, I'll introduce something into the quiet. So recently I was chatting with a good friend of mine, Mindy Dasher. She's actually in London. Um, and she's always working on innovative stuff. And she was telling me about this um, new firm called Medi Music. And the, the, the point of it is to, to develop the, uh, the evidence base that would allow music to be um, a social prescription that doctors 
will will have an, an intervention in a therapy where they write scripts <laughs> for music of various types where there's an understanding that given your symptoms, along with everything else that I will prescribe to you, the use of this app that will, as I as I don't understand this perfectly, but as you as it gives you music to listen to, I think there's some biometric measurement. So you get this feedback loop, which then allows a further optimization of music that addresses. And, you know, they're developing this. I'm looking at their website for anxiety, pain, cognitive impairment, and mental health. So this is just an example of an intervention, right? That, and I'm sure there are others that are being developed that, again, create a direct therapeutic um, benefit. And then of course, how do we see this not as just something for the critically ill, but something that is for prevention and wellness so that we stay healthy? I think that very many people in the society do this intuitively. We certainly are taught this in the communities and households that we grow up in. I mean, gospel music, which was kind of like mother's milk for me, you know, in the household that I grew up in, is still quite therapeutic. Um, and so, again, th this is a wonderful um, discussion, which encourages us to think of this not only in terms of, I get it, Becky, we need evidence and scientific proof and all of that, but then also how do we see this as an already existing cultural therapy that is hidden in blind sight all around us, but which we don't necessarily leverage, model, or teach to those around us as a therapy. And I'll stop at that. That's good, Craig. Okay, this is good. I, I've got two hands up and I'm going to play devil's advocate just quickly before I pass it on. Um, I get prescribed Celine Dion. Do I listen to it? I'm not a fan who's you know who's caused that and if my biometrics if i hated a genre i might get hyped up by it phys physiologically so so evidence for me that, that that was just devil's advocate gotta make sure it works yes. but um, okay that's cool so it was julia first then vanessa go for it yes thank you thank you becky i will try to be quick uh that make me also think about my own experience and it's not only I do not know if it's the part of this application, but what's also important is the explanation of what is happening. Uh, because sometimes when you are aware of what is happening to you and, and what, what is actually you, which stage in the crisis you're going through when somebody explains to you, uh, it goes much easier. So maybe it's not only a suggestion, maybe it's only also about explaining why you have been given this suggestion which poses probably a lot of different issues and challenges, uh, but just as an idea from my naive standpoint, thank you. Okay. Vanessa, over to you, and then Paul. Um, sure, just to jump off of what Craig was just talking about as well, something I've observed, um, so the music, um, for our founders, what it does is just give them permission to slow down. It's like one of the moments, right? They get this space of being able to start to kind of let go. And then what we do um, as they're listening to the music is um, have them do a creative activity, which coloring, playing with Legos, modeling clay, whittling wood. So like whatever it is. And What's so interesting, and I think you can do the same thing with music of when you are then involved with a a creative activity or um, a, a project where there's you're you're not training it in, nobody's looking at it, right? Where uh, the outcome we can really let go of the outcome, and it has just been it's so interesting to see these really like type A, like really um, like driven um, executives, just really kind of um, whether it's five minutes, 30 minutes, you know, if I can get more than 30 minutes from them, that's amazing. But even just being able to create that space for them to dive into something without any abandon, nobody cares. I mean, it's 
And even when I've gone through um, our own practices, it's like things come up about just your decision-making process. And I think that that um, not having to worry about being a, an amazing musician or an artist or what have you is, it's so freeing when so much, um, and also the shift around like achievement oriented goals versus practice oriented or just right the practices versus like the checklist and so that's something that we found to be super powerful um even in small doses of being able to then move that into then their business or whatever their you know their their other side um uh of the rest of their life <laughs> looks like so yeah thank you thanks Vanessa and Paul We've got um, yeah. a couple more minutes left. Just so yeah, I mean, it just I'll try and be quick. And on this, there's so many other stories I could tell, but just a couple of come to mind if we've got time. One is on our tour, we went to Bury, and we went to a place called the Big Fandango. Uh, Bury's not really famous for anything apart from black pudding, really, uh, but it, it's a, uh, an incredibly creative place. So there's a creative living centre at the south of the Bury and the Big Fandango, uh, which Rebecca set up after losing her 16 year old daughter to suicide. And and she gets people to do stuff there. So they have, you know, they do machine work and knitting and the, the makes the kids make hoodies and things like this. And uh, we had this zero suicide society transformation model, which we put in our report last year, and she turned it into a quilt. Um, so you know, it was all this kind of amazing creative stuff going on. Um, but again, the music was integrated into that when we had our get together. The council gave us the Met Theatre for the night, free of charge, uh, when we got everybody, all the community groups together. And um, we had the fire choir in the local fire station. I had a 40 strong choir called the fire choir. Um, also, I mentioned in the, in the chat about the radio show, the Jordan Space radio show. I, I thought about Frank Ritchie. We had Frank Ritchie on the show, lost his son Alan to suicide. Alan was a really uh, good footballer and, uh, and he was very happy playing football for fun, uh, but he was signed professionally and then uh, completely destroyed him and uh, he took his own life. And Frank was one of these people who thought, what can I do to make a difference? I'm not the kind of guy who's going to set up a charity or go out and lobby the government or anything. He said, I, I just, I'm a ukulele player. That's all I do. I go around pubs and clubs and play my ukulele. So he just adapted his his, uh, his shows. So he just goes around pubs and clubs in, in Scotland and Northern England. And if the mood's right, he starts talking about mental health and he starts talking about losing Alan, he starts talking about suicide, he starts talking about how he can prevent suicide, uh, how he can talk about it. And he just he just feels the mood each gig, you know, gig by gig. And he's done about, you know, he's probably done about 3,000 gigs now. And he probably spent about, you know, 2,000 of them talking about suicide and how he can prevent suicide. So I think we should be, you know, very, you know, we should recognize and respect the people who are doing it in the big organizations and, and, and the people who are scaling us up. But the people who are doing it, you know, one conversation at a time, 